Hello there, my name's Brandon, and recently I've been playing with a new feature that's been added to Clip Studio Paint, which is the ability to view 3D models with parallel projection. Normally when viewing 3D models, they have what's called perspective projection, which is that familiar look where objects become smaller the further away they are. If you trace out and follow the edges of these objects, you'll see that they all converge at the same point, which is referred to as the vanishing point. Now, in parallel projection, the perspective is fixed in place. It's sort of a stylized look where there is no vanishing point. Or rather, the perspective lines are all the same, uh, running parallel with each other rather than converging. What this means is that you end up with a fixed perspective across the entire 3D space. You could keep panning the camera beyond the scene and it'll always look the same. This perspective capability is really of interest to me because I make pixel art and it's quite common to use parallel projection in the form of top-down and isometric pixel art styles in games. So in this video, I'm gonna go through two examples of how to use this as a foundation for creating pixel art buildings. We're gonna start with a simple sort of top-down look and then move to a more involved isometric appearance. So let's get going. All right, to get the top-down started, I'll create a new document and I'm gonna use a canvas size of 160 by 160 pixels which will have us in the approximate range of a retro handheld kind of a sizing. And we can just imagine this being sort of the full viewable screen size. When I do this sort of retro style, I also like to have an eight x eight pixel grid overlay, since that tends to be how objects and sprites are composed for these consoles. So I'm just gonna quickly go up to view and select grid. And we can see the grid lines here, but clearly they're set up for someone who's making a much larger illustration than I am. So I'll just scale these down by going to view grid ruler settings, and then changing the grid setting to be every eight pixels instead. Now, before we start considering the building, I'm just gonna create a little character sprite because it'll be important to have some kind of reference point for how large the house should be. Uh, you could of course make the building first and then size the character to that, but I find it more useful to start with a character size that I like and then kind of scale the entire world to that character. In this case, I'm just making a blank body, sort of an RPG style character, and this one is 16 pixels in height. So that character scale is looking good on the canvas, and now we can bring in a 3D object to help create a house for them. Uh, we can find the 3D materials over in these folders here. So if we click on the bottom one, uh, which is called primitives, we'll see that that gives us access to a bunch of simple shapes that we could use to actually build a structure. Um, but there's also folders of a bunch of prefabbed objects too. And I'm gonna dig around into the background folder because there was a little neighborhood that I wanted to try. Uh, this one here that's called Residential Area 01. So all we have to do is just drag that onto our canvas and it'll instantiate the 3D object. Uh, and in this case, you know, we can see what amazing placement we've got with the little character peeking out there. Um, I'm kind of tempted just to leave it like that, but we need it for scaling. So I'll just drag that character layer on top so that we can use it for the sizing. When you've got a 3D model selected, you can reposition the camera using these first three icons here, uh, which give you rotation, panning, and zoom actions. And then the icons with the cube in them are actually used to move the model within the workspace. So I'm just gonna look around here and see what would make for a nice house for this character. And I think this one here with the angled roof would be nice to try from this vantage point. Uh, so I'll just get it positioned within the canvas relatively well. Now, this camera is still set up as the default perspective projection. Uh, we can even see a bit of that just in the way that these edges of the home are angling in like that. And we can imagine them converging at some point off screen. To change this into our parallel projection, we need to bring up the detailed controls by going up to window and subtool detail. Uh, there's a lot of stuff here relating to the 3D object appearance, but the one that we need is under the camera category. You'll see here it displays the projection method. Uh, right now this is set to perspective, so we just need to toggle it over to the other icon which is labeled parallel projection. And now we see that that perspective is kind of snapping into that fixed appearance that we talked about. Uh, looking along those edges of the home, it's really noticeable how it goes from that angled appearance into the parallel alignment, and definitely now gives off more of that retro RPG feel. So I'm just gonna fine tune the position again uh, now that we're in this new perspective. And for this retro look, I usually try to err on the side of having the home maybe be slightly smaller than what the character would dictate. And it's kind of a stylized thing, but it's sort of nice and efficient to have slightly small overworld homes. And then, you know, the interior could be larger than this once they go inside. 
All right, so this is gonna provide the foundation for my pixel illustration. So I'll create a new layer to draw the house on. And I'm also gonna reduce the opacity of the 3D layer to 50%, uh, just so I'll be able to see what I'm actually drawing on top of it. To frame out the basic structure of the house, I'm gonna use the line tool, uh, because the nice thing with the line tool is that you can hold shift and it'll lock the direction into being perfectly straight. Um, so you can basically just zip around and get all the major edges of everything framed out pretty easily that way. For this particular angle of the roof, uh, we can also see that I'm getting this sort of jagged pixel line. And that's really not the worst thing ever. Uh, there are ways to clean up and sort of use this kind of appearance. But for the purpose of simplicity, I'm going to improvise my own look here. And instead, I'll hold shift to move the line at a 45 degree angle and get this much cleaner line of pixels. Uh, this requires a larger height, of course, so we'll just have to improvise a bit and kind of build out a different roof uh, over top of the model. Uh, that's kind of the thing with this, uh, like the model provides a nice reference, but we can obviously deviate to make our own modifications, just depending how things start shaping up. Continuing on with the trace, uh, I'm at the point where the basic structure is mapped out. So I'll turn off the 3D layer and we can basically finish this out just by detailing the pixel art itself. I want to try making this adhere to that 8x8 grid a little bit more, uh, at least for the roof anyway, because I want to put some lines on it for some texturing, and it's usually easier to space those sorts of things out if they fit into some repeatable unit like the grid. Uh, I also kind of liked how we could see the, uh, the back slope of the roof as well in the model, so this adjustment also allowed for that to fit in again as well. For the coloring, I've dropped in this basic palette of grayscale tones. Uh, these are just evenly spaced values from 0 to 90 but this limited four color look is gonna lend more of that retro flair to it. I'm applying the tones in a way that conveys some sort of basic lighting scheme to the house where there's light hitting the left uh, with shadow on the right. And that happens to work really well with this angled roof since we can have the middle tone on that center section. Of course, the other thing is just finding ways to use all these tones together to create various details around the house uh, or adding small shadows and highlights along different trimmings. I'm keeping this one pretty basic, uh, but we've got a slight brick texture in there. There's some windows with a shine and uh, above the door, I think on the 3D model, that was like some sort of balcony area. So I've tried to just add in a railing to kind of suggest that up there as well. In the end, here's where I landed with that one. Uh, you know, not a bad adaptation from where it started. And I've just made a quick recolor still with four tones, but inspired a little bit by the original color scheme of the model itself. So that's looking good for the top-down approach, but let's move on now and see how this workflow could be used for isometric pixel art. To get started, I've got my canvas and character reference. Uh, this time I've gone with a larger canvas of 240 by 240 pixels and a character that's close to about 24 pixels in height. Once again, we'll go into the backgrounds folder and drag out that residential area into our workspace. Now, because the isometric perspective is such a particular viewpoint, we'll have to set up the camera angle quite carefully here. After toggling it to parallel projection, uh, there's a couple other settings that we want to configure manually. First of all, we'll come down here to the camera position, and we'll begin by setting each of the X, Y, and Z values to the same value. In this case, I'm using a value of 1000, but you could really use any number as long as they're all the same. Uh, what you'll find is actually that the number basically just reflects the zoom level. So in this case, a thousand happens to work well for me. The next thing we'll do is change the focal point position X, Y, and Z to all be zero. The reason we do this is because these focal point values would offset the camera position by those numbers, and it would make it so that those aren't equivalent anymore. So to make sure that we've got everything centered on the origin and at an equal position, it's just easiest to have the focal point values set to zero. So what we're looking at right now is actually a perfect isometric perspective. Uh, but there is a problem. And the problem is that pixel art isometric isn't actually the same as true isometric. It's really only an approximation. See, isometric pixel art is typically built out using lines composed of two pixel segments. And the angle created by those lines is only similar to that of a true isometric perspective. The result is that isometric pixel art is actually a slightly shallower angle compared to that of true isometric. So how do we account for this in the placement of our 3D model here? Well, for math reasons I won't bore you with in this video, as it happens, the shallower angle that we're looking for is achieved by dipping the camera Y value to about 82% of its original value. So instead of a value of 1000, if I now set this to 820, we'll get that slightly shallower appearance that will set this model up to be the proper angle for isometric pixel art. 
What's nice about this setup is that you can do it once with easy numbers like a thousand, like what I've used. And then if you zoom the camera in and out, it actually still maintains that same 82% proportion, even as the camera zoom level changes these values. After you find the right zoom level according to your canvas or character size, you can use the object controls to move the model around within the scene without compromising that camera setup. In fact, I'm actually gonna lock the camera on mine just by clicking this box next to the camera name. And that actually prevents the camera controls from being able to be adjusted at all. So the perspective is now very safe and secure in that sense. So once again, I'm gonna go shopping for a home for our character. And again, we'll do that by using the object controls to rotate and slide the model around within the workspace. Uh, I remember seeing this greenhouse earlier, and I think at this angle, it'll make a nice example for isometric pixel art. Uh, just as before, I'll reduce the opacity of the 3D model layer to 50%, and then trace out my pixel art on a new layer using the line tool. And now we can see the incredible payoff from all that careful setup that we did. Uh, you can see that as I drag my lines over the reference, I'm naturally just conforming to that two pixel segmenting that we want to see. So that tells me that the camera is in the exact perfect placement. Uh, as an aside, if you find setting up the camera using this XYZ and 82% correction format to be a bit much for you, uh, a more practical approach you could try would be to draw out your isometric pixel art lines ahead of time. And then all you'd have to do is kind of rotate your model until it conforms with those. Even if it's off by a little bit, you'd probably still do all right. And we're just using it as a reference anyway. But with the original workflow, I just wanted to make sure that we did know the exact proper math to do this workflow in a way that was very repeatable. So I'm just continuing to trace this out using the line tool. Uh, and keep in mind that the line tool allows you to sort of float over different angles. So you kind of have to watch for the segments to reach the point at which they're in a nice placement. Uh, you could always use the dot pen to draw out things, you know, two pixels at a time. But again, I find the line tool to be much faster for this sort of thing. You'll notice this time around, I've got a bit of that jagged roof thing happening again, just sort of happens with these odd angles, I guess. Uh, but this time I left it because I just wanted to show how to work with this sort of artifacting a little bit. Sometimes you can kind of spin it into an advantage actually. Uh, so in this case, I've started uh, just cleaning up the jagged line work by simply erasing those pixels. Uh, and this leaves a broken line, but it at least draws less attention uh, than having mismatched angles. And that's one approach that I use often, uh, but this time it actually gave me the idea to place panel lines across the roof instead. And that way the little jagged break in the line actually becomes sort of this dimensional thing of the roof panel, uh, almost as if it has a slight overlap from panel to panel uh, as shingles might have. So it works out kind of nice just to establish a more interesting silhouette and texture here, I think. To finish this out, I'll bring in the four grayscale colors like we had before and shade the home so that there's a light side and a dark side again. Continuing on with the detailing, uh, it's similar to what we saw with the top-down example, but the key difference here being that we're generally seeing a bit more dimensionality with some of these additions. Uh, things like windows and door frames might do well to have an extra pixel or two just to show that they kind of bump out from the wall or into the wall, whatever the case may be. After some finishing touches, here's what I've got from that house. And once again, here's another recolor, but this time using more of a green color scheme. Overall, I found the isometric example to be a bit more insightful in this case, uh, only because the perspective here can sometimes be really challenging when creating pixel art. So having that 3D model with its underlying geometry and the angled roof and all the things like that really helps instruct on how to properly depict those sorts of complex angles in pixel art. There's a lot of potential here in modeling out structures as a means of simplifying the pixel art process, particularly when perspective can be such a tricky thing in its own right. So I hope you found this useful and thanks for watching. Clip Studio Paint.